my first exposure, like a lot of like a lot of people, particularly people my age, um, was uh, Leonard Nimoy's uh, In Search of. Uh, I think that was probably, I don't know, maybe I was six or seven when that had come out. And already at that point, uh, spending a lot of time in the woods myself, uh, it really piqued my interest. I think in the early 70s in general, in the wake of the Patterson footage, um, I think there was kind of a general buzz about the topic uh, already. Uh, and when I when I saw that episode, uh, yeah, it, it struck me as a young as a young boy, and uh, and I was always interested. Um, I remember um, back then in school we had the bookmobile and and the, this uh, mobile library um, would you know come around to all the schools and stuff. And one of the first books that I had bought was called Bigfoot. Um, by um by uh Ann Slate and Alan Berry and it just documented uh you know a lot of different eyewitness accounts and that sort of thing and you know throughout my life I was uh you know just read up on the topic and then um I suppose it was 2002 2003 came across uh the BFRO website and they were um holding an expedition in upstate New York. Uh, I had a house up there and spent a lot of time in the Adirondack Mountain uh, range. And uh, yeah, I went uh, to the first one in 2005, went to the following one in 2006. And there I met my eventual co-author of the book. And uh, yeah, we, we started from there. And that's when I went from, I guess you could say, you know, maybe passing interest to actually going out into the field and pursuing and interviewing uh, eyewitnesses and stuff like that. What all did you find <clears throat> interesting that you included within your book? Well, the the book had kind of a lot of things that you would expect for such a book. Yeah. So there was there's the eyewitnesses accounts, uh, the interviews and, and all that sort of thing. We didn't get we didn't get too much into the uh, evidence, uh, you know, that exists to support, um, you know, to to support the idea of existence. Um, for us, the book was we got into that to some degree, but for the most part, uh, my my co-author he uh, uh, he investigates paranormal activity, so he was involved. Uh, in an organization called the uh, the Atlantic Paranormal Society, so we shared a lot of stories. Um, he uh, he came with me to a lot of the um, to a lot of the eyewitnesses that I that I interviewed, and we kind of compared that to what he did. So for us, the the bulk of our interest, at least as far as the book went, is. When, when I think about all the people that I've interviewed over the over the decades now, you can certainly discount, you know, X amount uh, number as uh, maybe misidentification. Somebody saw a bear uh, scratching itself on a tree up on, um, you know, posted up on a tree and they kind of it appeared to them to be a bipedal uh, animal walking on two feet. So there's that. And then there's, you know, some some hoaxers, you know, and there's always that sort of thing. Um, so that will account for a, a percentage for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think some people and, you know, I, I think in regard to people who reached out to me, some of them, I think, were maybe just lonely. Um, but that still left a lot of folks that I spoke to and, of course, never meeting them before. What I knew is I could I said to myself, I'm not so sure they saw what they claim that they saw, but I knew one thing and that's that they believed what they saw was, uh, was real. And what we wrote about in, in comparison to what my co-author does as far as people seeing ghosts and apparitions, um, 
a lot of the book discussed how that impacts people psychologically. Is there a, kind of a profile uh, of these people, which we were confident that there wasn't, but we were interested in a compare contrast as far as, um, uh, you know, who are the people who see these things and how do they compare to each other uh, and what happens to them um, cognitively when when you witness something, you know, previously assumed to not exist and how does it affect your um, your perception in the rest of your life? Because I think, you know, to use Sasquatch as an example, if someone is out hiking in the woods, they come face to face with this animal or, you know, however people want to classify it. And, and when you're face to face with something that you previously, shall we say, didn't believe in, what that does to your line as far as your perception of reality, does that mean that the boogeyman that you feared under your bed as a child is suddenly real? How does that affect um, the way you look at the rest of the world? And uh, I think for me, it's, it's funny too, I just exchanged texts with him uh, a, a few days before I heard from you. The most fascinating eyewitness account in the book was a man, uh, he was a young man when I, when I met him back in 2005, I think. His name was Alan, and uh, well, his name is Alan, I should say. Uh, he lives in the southeastern section of the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. Um, and he shared with me a story then and I, you know, took notes and interviewed him and, and was on his uh, property. The area in which he lives is well documented. Um, there's a book by a gentleman by the name of Paul Bartholomew called Monsters of the Northwoods. And, and Alan lives in this area where um, has a long history, uh, including a situation where a, a police officer came forward. And of course, there was a lot of uh, controversy that that went along with with that um and and we spent some time on his property and and talking to him and what what struck me first is is what would motivate him to come forward he didn't want anyone to know he was very secretive um he obviously wasn't uh, motivated by money because we didn't have any <laughs> um so it's not like he was, you know, looking to get paid. He wanted no notoriety. And he was very matter of fact, and this this varies from witness to witness as well. Some some people when they when they witness this sort of thing, they it's very important to them that they kind of carry this message that that they want other people to know what happened to them that these animals, or, or again, however you describe them, um, are real. And it's it kind of becomes a vocation for them. You know, they want to kind of spread the, spread the message. And then there are people like Alan who told me, um, he said, you know, I really don't care if people, if I were to go public, which he was not interested in doing, but he, he was like, I really don't care. Um, if people were to believe me or not, I, I know they're there. I know what I saw. Um, and that's good enough for me. So fast forward, um, 12 years later, <clears throat> and Mike and I started to assemble to gather the material for the book. And, uh, I said, I wonder if we can, if I can find Alan and, you know, thanks to the internet and, uh, the, the small world in which we live, I, I did. And, and he was now, uh, you know, 30, you know, 30 or so and had uh, a child, uh, another one on the way. And what really blew me away was I interviewed him again, you know, 12, 13 years later. And I had my notes from our original interview and, and I took very detailed notes. And, you know, almost a decade and a half later, when I interviewed him, his story was exactly the same. I mean, details, um, you know, how he explained it, what he was doing out there. And, and that, that struck me 
you know, and, and obviously it's, it's not an argument as far as does Sasquatch exist or do they not, but he obviously uh, thinks, you know, that they, that they do. And I find it very hard to believe that he would want to perpetuate a hoax to the point where he would memorize such a detailed story so he could maybe talk to me about it so many years later. You know, the people that I interview as well, they, I don't know what they're experiencing, but certainly whatever it is that they're experiencing, they believe their story and it is in such detail with such sincerity. Um, I certainly believe they're experiencing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. I mean, again, I can't, I can't speak for everyone I spoke to, but you can, I hate to say you can just tell because that kind of begs the question how you can tell. Uh, but but I do think that there are some baseline um, details when you're speaking to somebody uh, as far as the credibility of their story. Um, and, and that's what it came down to for, for uh, Michael Robarts is my uh, co-author and I. What, what would motivate people? Obviously, there are some high profile people who perpetuate hoaxes for fame or, you know, money or, or you know, what have you. Uh, maybe just the, um, the satisfaction of fooling people. But most people that we spoke to didn't certainly didn't fall into any of those categories, you know, not not logically uh, anyway. What did you find in your um, in your research for the book on the uh, the profile of the individuals that not only experience Bigfoot but also experience other paranormal type things? Mm, yeah. So as we suspected, um, but you have you have to do the work first to to say it with confidence. There really there really wasn't um, there really wasn't any uh, you know common thread. But I do think uh, it was interesting in that I, I think people's, the, the walks of life that they came from kind of um, impacted whether it was a positive experience or a negative experience. Um, I spoke to uh, a woman who was, she was very active in her church. She worked at, at a rectory and she's very, very involved. Now, I didn't, I didn't ask her how deep her faith was, but I assumed that she was a, a, a faith-based woman, you know, maybe not necessarily, but uh, based on our conversations, she was disturbed. You know, I, I, I don't, I got the impression that she found it very disturbing. And, and I think a reason why it's understandable, I think, when you come from that perspective is where does this, and I, I don't like to use the term thing, but to use the term animal maybe uh, suggests something that is not necessarily so based on who you talk to, but but where does this, whatever it is, fit into you know, things like creation and, and uh, you know, evolution and that sort of thing. And, and I, that could be a touchy subject, particularly with some faith-based, uh, you know, folks, is, you know, where, where does this fit in into the grand scheme? So there's a lot to reconcile there. Um, and, uh, you know, school teachers, uh, Quite a few police officers I've spoken to over the years, and I think that's the simple fact that they're often out at night. They have, uh, you know, flashlights and find themselves uh, in in some precarious uh, places. Children, um, and that's always interesting because, of course, uh, you know, when uh, you know children, maybe that definitive line between imagination and 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 reality can be a little, little bit you know, blurred, shall we say, but, but also the flip side of that, the, the counter to that is that people uh, involved in field research, uh, and it does make sense that um, children would be more approachable and less intimidating. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost like for, for every suggestion as to why there isn't, uh, there is a counter to why there there may be uh, like the how come we never found, find a, a body is is a valid question. And 
Mike and I, I think, I think why we kind of join forces, if you will, is I say to this day, I don't necessarily believe in Bigfoot. I, I need more, you know, I, I need more. Certainly, um, people have been convicted of crimes with less evidence than exists to support the idea. But what I do believe in is I believe very much uh, in the possibility of, so, you know, we kind of reside, I, I guess, in that, in that gray area. Um, Sometimes they're described as uh, appearing and disappearing, becoming orbs, then becoming full uh, fledged flesh and blood creatures. Have did you get into any of that in your your book? Um, not not very not very deeply. I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of folks who who attach those things to it in in the first book that i mentioned that i read uh alan barry and ann slade's book it's just titled bigfoot there's a fascinating chapter called uh the pennsylvania effect and it documents um something that happened is way back in uh 72 or 73 i think so it's a while ago i mean that book i think came out in 75 or 76 but uh uniontown pennsylvania where these these people had uh um, a uh, a very what they described as an extremely close encounter that first involved a UFO and then I guess you could say Bigfoot like creatures. Um, in the 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 area that I mentioned before of upstate New York, um, that has a long history uh, of Sasquatch sightings, uh, UFOs as well. So. You know, there, there, there could be, there could be a direct correlation between the two. It could be just that, for whatever the reason, um, people who are open to seeing one, interpret, uh, interpreting one, are also open to interpreting another. So it's interesting. Yeah, that that could be contingent upon the area. It could be contingent upon the witnesses who live in the area and how they're interpreting. So again, there, there's, there's a psychological. Uh, you know, uh, factor in, in there, perhaps. Do you have any kind of an idea if you believe that there are some, some um, flesh and blood creature, or do you believe that there is something supernatural? Um, I, I would lean more towards uh, just an undiscovered uh, animal, for sure. You know, that being said, um, you know, I mean, we're we're not so sure exactly how animals fully communicate, and if there's any telepathic ability, whether it's strictly between the the species itself, and does it? You know, it's it's hard for us to measure. I've I've had this ongoing discussion with a friend of mine about how we measure intelligence, and um, perhaps it's a bit, um, uh, you know, of some mammalian. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't know, uh, self-centeredness maybe, or our collective egos, but we, we put ourselves at the top. And, you know, un until I see a, a dolphin driving a car, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that's fair. But at the same token, um, I think we measure animal intelligence based on our, you know, what we know of intelligence. And, Sometimes I wonder is, uh, you know, are we are we measuring their intelligence with the wrong instrument? Uh, in other words, you know, I mean, obviously, an uh, animal cannot read, but what does that say about their mental capacity to do other things that we can't really perceive as far as communication? I mean, uh, I've read I've read articles and columns about how trees communicate moss and, and fungi and, and that sort of thing. So. You know, I, I I would have to say that I think that they are flesh and blood animals and, and somewhere in the sphere of ape and 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 uh, human, you know, as far as intelligence goes. Um, but I guess that doesn't mean that that they're that they don't have some kind of communication capability that we would consider to be. Uh, you know, supernatural in comparison to our to ourselves, I guess, if that makes sense. 
What do you think about the Sierra sounds? Have you heard those? I have, in fact, yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's certainly interesting. I, I mean, I, I can't make this bold claim like, you know, well, that's the real thing because, you know, who who am I? But, but certainly it's unlike anything that I've ever heard. Um, the story that goes along with it. Uh, as a matter of fact, they re reference that in the in the same book that uh, that I mentioned before. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think for for a lot of us who are invested in the topic, um, you know, it has to be uh, it has to be acknowledged. Um, the audio has been uh, analyzed. You know, I mean, just to the upteenth degree. And, uh, you know, I think it's easy for people to wave their hand and go, well, you know, that's not real or it's this or it's that. One of the one of the most interesting things I've gotten to do over the years is um, the industry I work in. Obviously, I don't advertise that I wrote this book and something I've done just for my own uh, curiosity, I guess, if you will, is. For example, a good friend of mine for a company I work for, uh, he's a bit younger than me, too. He's probably maybe 10 or so years younger. Um, we were talking one day, and, and sometimes I'll kind of steer the, the topic uh, in that direction, because I'm just curious what everyday people think about it, their reaction, especially those people who may be you know, maybe they're, they they don't spend a lot of time in the field. They're not big outdoorsy people or, or that sort of thing. And we got on the topic and, you know, his immediate reaction was, you know, yeah, that's all fake. And, and of course, I just kind of play neutral. You know, yeah, you think so? Did you ever see the Patterson, you know, the famous footage? And so I pull up the, the footage, you know, on... Um, on a computer and and we're watching. I, I can't remember if he said that he had seen it previously or not, but it's very interesting to me because two or three seconds in, he goes, oh, come on, that's fake. So I said, okay, you know, yeah, I, I, you're probably right. But what, what tells you that it's fake? You know, do you see a zipper? Do you see sneakers on the bottom of the feet of the, you know, what, what, what indicates to you so confidently that it's fake and what i find interesting is I've, I've done that to a few people some people in my family and and friends and i have yet to have anyone come up and give a specific reason as to why they think it's fake and michael and i discussed this in the book i i can't help but wonder if a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's not that people don't necessarily think it's real. It's that they don't want to think it's real. Because again, to suggest that something like that exists is maybe to force oneself to open the door to other things that we really would prefer not to think about. I'm sorry, my, my landlady's cat is being really um, very, very demanding. Um, so I, yeah, I, I can't help but wonder if, if pe some, some people, I think may be a bit closed to the idea of the possibility because it takes their, uh, it takes them into kind of dark corners of the brain where, you know, maybe we'd rather not go. You have to be pretty open-minded to go down the Bigfoot trail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and open open to some criticism depending upon how uh, far you want to go a lot of shows mm -hmm. out there right now on bigfoot yeah. lots of books out there on bigfoot lots of new conferences coming up um you know it's just it's become kind of a real uh, a real trendy <clears throat> thing whether people believe in it or they don't believe in it it's still kind of uh, kind of nice and a lot of the shows that i watch um, there's a lot of nature in it. And I think, you know, that kind of gets people out into the, in their mind anyway, out into the woods and the adventure of it. Um, how much of it do you think is the mystery of not knowing if it exists or not? Yeah, I think there are some people who really enjoy it. And I, and I think from the comfort of one's living room, it's certainly, uh, you know, I, 
I think on the surface, it's it's kind of a fun topic. And and again, I think those who invest a lot of time, you know, I guess you can say it's fun, but maybe maybe we're not crazy about the term. But but yeah, for those who are kind of like into um who don't get too vested in it, perhaps, you know, just, you know, you watch Harry and the Hendersons, uh, you know, you watch one of the reality TV shows out there and you kind of have fun with it. There, there are plenty of those people. And, you know, it's, it's interesting for me. I, I got to a point where, like, for example, the casts that have been taken well documented. Um, I think it's, it's, very, very significant evidence, and, and it, it can't be ignored for sure. And and I think to the average person, I'm not so sure um, people realize how significant it is. You know, I think there are a lot of people out there who kind of say to themselves, well, you know, big deal. You know, you got to plaster Paris in the shape of a foot, who maybe don't realize that that the the details that are reflected in these casts are they they demand an explanation that some people don't have or maybe don't want to give so for for me i think all of those things are still relevant but on the other hand as far as it becoming a widely accepted um you know concept I think we're at a point whether, you know, where, you know, we can get a thousand more very clear casts. We can get hundreds more uh, video clips of, shall we say, video that's less than conclusive. It's not that uh, those things are insignificant, but I don't think it's really going, I don't know that it's going to change public uh perception and and personally i'm not so sure that we that we should because there's also i i I feel there's a moral discussion to it as well is that do we want to you know do we want the masses to know what is what is that going to look like i mean i i remember the spotted owl arguments in the mid 90s and you had a group of people who were who were very very protective of these owls and understandably so pitted against a group of people who made their livelihood um you know harvesting timber in these forests and you know i remember it well i watched with great interest as somebody who's who's just generally interested in you know the natural world and you know it it got ugly, you know, quite, quite frankly. And, and when I think of if um, we, we just got undisputable, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, evidence that just could not be the smoking gun, so to, so to speak, you know, a body was found or a live specimen was found. I mean, I think, I think a lot of us spend so much time looking forward to, to that. The question is, well, what then? What does that do with housing laws, zoning laws, hunting? You know, I mean, you know, somebody out there is going to say, well, hey, you know, new new big game hunting. And, and you know, I, I, I can't I can't imagine the discussions that that would, uh, you know, result in. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny for 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 Mike and I. We would like to have those kind of experiences to satisfy our own curiosity, which is really the only reason that I uh, was interested in. I, I'm not interested really in making this um, necessarily like a contribution to, to science or, um, but I, I don't know, you know, maybe it's, maybe it could be a bit selfish, you know, after the, after the fact. Um, because uh, you know, I would imagine that at the very least, the the wilderness areas where they were found and known to be would be flooded with not just scientists, not just researchers, but I mean, I, I live just a few blocks from the beach in uh, in New Jersey, and I, I can't tell you how many how many dolphins, for example, have been have been beached, and 
you know, people pass them around taking taking selfies, you know, instead of just returning them to the water. So, you know, I, I think there's a moral argument there that I don't, we talked about it in the book. I, I haven't heard a lot of discussion about it otherwise is, you know, maybe it's in our best interest to find out uh, about this animal who, who, you know, is a cousin or, you know, whatever the case to us. But what does it mean for for them, you know? Possibly a closer relative than anticipated. I can understand that too opens up a whole new means of, of having to define um, the human race, possibly. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Well, what else can you tell me? What else do you think um, that uh, your research for the book and your uh, exploration of this topic has um, has given you? Um, perspective on the on the on the people, and you know, some some considered uh, their experiences to be almost religious. Uh, some were horrified, and it kept them up for for many a night. So the interpretation of it, I think. Uh, was really, really fascinating for for sure. And that's how um, I asked Alan, um, you know, are you are you grateful? You know, are you glad it happened or do you wish that you never saw it? And uh, and he was grateful. And what was particularly interesting about his story was he uh, he had kept it from some of the, some family members who later on came forward to him with their stories. And only then did he share with those family members his story. Um, and that happened, uh, I, Mike and I were probably midway through the book and he had called me up and he was very excited or he texted me and was very excited and said, um, you know, give me a call, which is not something that he ordinarily did. Busy man, young family. Um, and yet it turned out an immediate family member had shared with him um, their experience and they were very, very upset and frightened. And he said, you know, I guess kind of uh, basically consoling them and just said, hey, listen, just so you know, I, I had a similar experience, you know, years ago. So, yeah, some people grateful and, and feel very lucky. Some people frightened and, and, you know, wish it never happened. Some people kind of uh you know grab the torch and they they want everybody to know they become very passionate about it these things are real and we have to know that and and for the most part i think their their intentions are good you know they 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 want them protected and all that sort of thing but again you know we do harm with with good intentions and and also i think you know i i i have to acknowledge a, a, a certain amount of people that I've met on the research side and some of them want to find Bigfoot and, and some of them, I think, wish that they were Bigfoot. Uh, you know, I, I think, I guess with anything, you can, you can draw the line or, or cross the line into obsession. Um, and it happens with witnesses, understandably so, because people are looking for answers. Um, and I've seen it happen with with folks on the research side as well, where, uh, you know, I I know a guy that I met in the St. Lawrence County region of New York along the, you know, way up the Canadian border. And he had an experience and then he got into the research. And the last I spoke to him, which was a bit ago, but I mean, his his marriage was hanging in the balance because it, it really, you know, he was. He was obsessed. And, uh, you know, it's it's understandable, you know, um, because there's that cognitive dissonance between what I know to be real. Um, and, you know, I have the the 401k and the minivan and the white picket fence. And this is, quote unquote, normal. And then I cross paths with something that rocks my world it's very it's a very violent collision between what i know to be normal and sensible and all of a sudden your entire identification system is just completely thrown off you're forced to make room 
for this new reality that you simply cannot deny because it's right in front of you. And you have to acknowledge it. And how do you how do you do that? Because there's I think uh, for a lot of people, there's a ripple effect that cannot help but but have an impact on on the way you, you know, uh, perceive everything else. And uh, yeah, I think the, the psychological element, Mike, Mike, in, in his field of the paranormal deals with that quite a bit, is that people are very frightened. And, and what's different between our two uh, endeavors, I guess, is, you know, once I leave the wilderness and I get back to the pavement, um, you know, Bigfoot is is really, uh, you know, kind of left behind. You know, people can put kind of a, a, a border between them, whereas with paranormal experience, ghosts and apparitions, it, it occurs right in their house. So we've kind of swapped a lot of ideas on uh, you know, those, those two things, but, you know, I, I mean, once you see something, you, you can't unsee it. Uh, you have to, you know, you somehow have to reconcile that. And, and some people do that a lot uh, better than others.